Welcome everyone to our fetal alcohol spectrum disorder webinar. My name is Jessica Finucan. I'm a school psychologist with Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center. We'll be joined later with Erin Papanikis. She's also a school psychologist with MFNRC. Our agenda today will cover understanding FASD, diagnosing FASD, and supporting individuals with FASD. So before we get started into some of the content, we're gonna go through some common misconceptions around FASD. Um, number one, individuals will, with FASD will outgrow it. Um, this is untrue, it's actually a lifelong disability. There is no benefit to receiving a diagnosis. Again, it is, a, is very beneficial to receive a diagnosis, especially um, early on, so you can begin intervention as early as possible. People with FASD have low IQs. This is also a misconception. Uh, people with FASD have um, different strengths and weaknesses and um, their IQ will vary. Individuals with FASD will plateau at grade four in their ability to learn. This is a myth. also untrue. FASD students can um, go well past grade four level. The behavior problems associated with FASD are a result of poor parenting. This is also untrue. Um, FASD is a disability associated with the brain, which um, would result in a behavioral problem. The mothers of these individuals must be alcoholic. Social drinking wouldn't. Um, no amount of alcohol is safe during pregnancy. Um, it can happen before you even know you're pregnant. So this is also untrue. FASD is only an issue for certain populations. FASD can actually affect any socioeconomic status um, community. It can also affect any ethno-cultural group or um, young mothers, old mothers. It can affect anybody. The mothers of children with FASD could have easily chosen not to drink during pregnancy. They damaged their children through callousness. This is untrue. Was, the mother was not being cruel to their child. Um, again, there is no safe amount of alcohol during pregnancy. Um, and we also have to be aware of mothers that have that struggle with substance abuse. And a woman who has FASD will have children with FASD. There is no correlation between a woman who has FASD and if their child will have FASD. Uh, so fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a diagnostic term used to describe the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure on an individual's brain and body. It is a lifelong disability, and it's the leading developmental disability in Canada, affecting 4% of Canadians. FASD actually impacts people in Canada, more people in Canada than autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, and Down syndrome combined. Um, and because fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is considered an invisible disability, uh, it is likely that the percentage is actually higher than this. So in the past, there's been many terms that describe um, what we now know as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, in, it began first in 1973, where fetal alcohol syndrome was made. Um, it was about prenatally exposed to amounts of alcohol and demonstrated a particular pattern of facial characteristics, growth delay, and brain impairment. Um, we now know that it, is, um, it isn't very common to have those facial features and things like that. So um, now in 2015 in Canada, the only term used is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder with or without sentinel facial features. Um, and then you'll see in the middle that these are all the other types that it has been called in the past. So each person with FASD has both strengths and challenges. Individuals with FASD are known to have a number of strengths or different strengths, including being friendly, likable, affectionate, determined, hardworking, forgiving, and non-judgmental. So signs and symptoms are typically um, 
divided into primary characteristics and secondary characteristics. So primary characteristics reflect the underlying uh, central nervous system damage caused by prenatal exposure to alcohol. So there are brain-based symptoms. Um, they include inconsistent memory and recall, inability to filter out distractions and sensory stimuli, slow and inconsistent cognitive and auditory processing, decreased mental stamina, difficulty interpreting and applying abstract concepts such as managing money and time, impulsivity and poor judgment, inability to predict outcomes of their own or other actions, difficulty shifting from one context to another, resistance to change, inability to see another person's perspective, and inability to recognize indirect social cues. The secondary characteristics are features that usually occur later on in life or as a result of the primary characteristics. So um, people with FASD often have mental health problems, about 90% of individuals, um, poor academic achievement and school failure, disrupted school experiences such as suspension, expulsion, or dropout, alcohol or drug problems. Involvement with the law, so trouble with authorities, charged or convicted of crimes. Confinement, which is um, the inpatient treatment for mental health or um, alcohol or drug problems, or even incarceration for crime. Sexually inappropriate behavior, problems with employment, and dependent living. So some factors that influence the severity and type of the effects for someone with FASD um, can include frequency, amount, and timing of alcohol that was consumed during pregnancy, mother's ability to met metabolize alcohol, mother's overall health and nutrition, the mother's use of other legal and illegal drugs, the age of the mother, and even the genetics of the fetus. Um, again, it's important to remember that there is no safe amount of alcohol use during pregnancy. So the referral process for FASD in Manitoba, um, referrals are made to the Manitoba FASD network. They should be submitted to the FASD diagnostic coordinator in your region. Um, referrals can be, are accepted from families, physicians, uh, child and family services, schools, healthcare professionals, and community agencies. Once the referral is completed and submitted, it is assessed by Manitoba um, FASD network for eligibility, and once it's approved, an intake pack package is then sent to the parent or guardian, or if, um, if they're in the care of child and family services, it would be sent to them, um, and the coordinator can help you um, fill out all those forms and what your next steps are. Um, once those forms are completed, um, this, the FASD, this person with FASD would be placed on a wait list um, for assessment. So. Um, then once um, the person with FSD goes through the assessment process, it's usually with a multidisciplinary team. It can involve a social worker or FASD coordinator to help them navigate through the whole process or if they need any support. Um, speech language pathologist often looks at um, communication um, may assess their speech and hearing needs. Um, geneticists often looks at, um, they do a complete physical examination of the um, person who's being referred or assessed. Occupational therapists might look at uh, coordination, motor skills, play skills, or self-care activities. Psychologists will look at um, cognitive abilities, memory, behavior, uh, life skills, that kind of thing. And then a medical doctor or pediatrician will look at development mental skills, and they also make the diagnosis with the rest of the team. So for an official diagnosis, it must come from a medical doctor or pediatrician. Um, the type of diagnosis that can be made is FASD with sentinel or without sentinel facial features associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. And those facial features are often small eyes, smooth skin between the nose and upper lip or and a thin upper lip. Um, cannot make an alcohol related diagnosis without confirming prenatal alcohol exposure. And if there's no confirmation, an alcohol related diagnosis will not be made. So the con confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure can come from the parent themselves, but it can also come from um, 
other creditable means, such as other family members or birth records. Um, a comprehensive assessment will still help the individual and their support network understand the individual's unique abilities and needs, even if a formal diagnosis is not made. Many services can be assessed, accessed with or without the alcohol-related diagnosis if the person meets other criteria for support. Um, and some protective factors that will help um, somebody with FASD um, is early diagnosis so that we can intervene earlier, educational support and access to FASD resources, um, loving, nurturing and a stable home environment and the absence of violence in their home or otherwise. And some treatments and sports that can help somebody with FASD is um, medical specialists or medical care, um, SLP, OT, PT, or mental health care, et cetera, medication to help lessen some of the symptoms of FASD, alternative approaches such as creative art therapy or um, meditation, uh, parent trainings on FASD and strategies so that um, those in the household know how uh, to support them as well, and then um, school supports, which we'll be focusing on today. Um, I'll give it over to Erin, and she's going to go through some of the school supports with us. Okay, so as Jessica mentioned, there's many different avenues where treatments and supports can be offered. Um, and the one we're going to focus on today is uh, school support. So it is very possible for individuals with FASD to achieve positive outcomes um, when their challenges are addressed early on in life, as early as possible, and they have access to appropriate um, supports and treatments. So even though we are looking at uh, school supports in this section, um, it is important to highlight that some of these same supports can also be implemented at home as well. So the most effective treatments are those that are used and reinforced um, in different environments that the, the individual is in. So for example, at school and at home, um, so that school staff and families um, can work together to create supportive environments for um, these individuals. So each student with FASD will be very different um, and have individual needs. So it's important to get to know your students um, in order to understand the supports that they might require. Okay, so these are some of the main um, brain functions that are affected um, by FASD. So cognition, academic achievement, memory, executive functioning or abstract reasoning, um, attention, adaptive skills, and emotion regulation. So these different brain functions are what we are going to kind of cover and focus on as we move through this section on supporting uh, individuals with FASD. So we're going to look at what FASD can look like when each area of brain functioning is affected, as well as what types of supports that children and students um, might require if these uh, domains are affected by FASD. And for each brain domain, strategies that have been proven successful are suggested. And some of these may work with a particular student and some may not. So each student, again, is unique um, in the supports that they require and their skills. Um, so teachers just um, must get creative and persistent in finding you know, what would work for that student. As well, um, an individual with FASD may have impacts in some of these areas or in all of them. Um, and how to support the student may require you to consider these multiple domains to find what works for that individual student. So you might notice that their memory is not as strong, um, which is also impacting their academic achievement. So kind of looking at both of these areas and the supports that um, might help the student. So the first brain domain we are going to look at is our cognition, which is the mental processes that we use when we gain knowledge and understand the information we are gaining. So for individuals with FASD, there's a wide range of IQ scores or cognitive scores that can be found. 
Um, when cognition is affected, individuals can have difficulties with thinking, with reasoning, um, short-term or long-term planning, um, solving problems on their own, and understanding complex topics and ideas. So some of the ways that we can support students is by using a lot of repetition, reteaching in different settings to help with generalization. So for example, if you're teaching um, an individual a certain social skill, you might teach the student one-on-one -on -one first to give them that knowledge. For example, maybe greetings or introductions, and then reteach them in different social settings so that they know I use these skills when I'm in these settings interacting with my peers. So just to help with that generalization. Um, we want to give them lots of opportunities to practice the skills that they're being taught, um, providing visual cues in addition to verbal cues to help with comprehension, modeling certain tasks um, that we might want them to do or engage in, and providing more time on assignments, giving short and simple directions, Sometimes one direction at a time is required. And then using multiple modalities for teaching and learning. For example, providing verbal instruction while also providing um, visual cues. Um, or if they're not strong writers, can they do the assignment maybe orally or through photos or visuals? So just kind of getting creative with that. So the second domain we're going to cover is academic achievement. So this is not really a brain function, but it's important to include as many students with FASD often struggle in different academic areas. So academic achievement is essentially the extent to which a student has achieved their educational goals. So students with FASD may struggle with reading and math, uh, comprehending oral or written text, um, organizing their work and supplies and abstract concepts that come up across different subjects. So some ways that we can support students um, experiencing these struggles can include providing concrete manipulatives for subjects such as math, um, focusing on more practical and functional math. So for example, focusing on time, um, time management, money management, learning math in different environments like um, for example, the cafeteria, can they learn math through things like measurement, um, temperature, things like that. Um, providing instructions in more than one way. So finding what works for that student and then what they can understand best. Um, dur during longer assignments, stopping at key points to check for comprehension, make sure they're still following. And then connecting the what the student is learning to their own prior knowledge to help kind of solidify that information. And then teaching the student how to make and use lists and calendars, uh, color-coded binders, and other strategies to help with organization. So the third domain of brain functioning that can be affected by FASD is memory. So memory is the mental capacity that we use to retain information um, into our memory storage and then retrieving that information when we need to use it again. So retaining and retrieving. So students whose memories are impacted by FASD might frequently appear like they're um, telling a lie uh, when you ask them a question, but in fact, what they're doing is um, kind of filling in those gaps with just information that comes to mind in that moment um, for the simple fact that they just can't remember um, details with certain events. Um, they might appear forgetful, struggle with memorization, and have difficulty accessing, selecting, and organizing information. So kind of that retrieval piece of memory. Um, some ways we can support students with deficits in their memory can include um, providing consistent routines and structure so that they don't have to remember what's happening on different days or times of the day, and they know what to expect um, day in and day out. Um, providing a lot of repetition to help get that information kind of into that working memory and long-term memory. Um, providing hands-on activities can help to engage the student more and help them understand the information so that they might remember it um, a little better. 
um, presenting new material at slower rates so they have time to kind of process it and really learn it. Um, Pre-teaching new concepts and providing frequent reminders. So for example, you might pre-teach um, key terms that are coming, um, that might pop up in an up upcoming unit that's going to be taught. Um, teaching and using mnemonic memory strategy. So um, common one would be bed mass. So that kind of helps to um, remember those steps um, that you would take. And then sequencing practice. So putting events or information in specific orders. <clears throat> So the next domain of brain functioning is executive functioning and abstract reasoning. So <clears throat> executive functioning skills are a set of related processes needed to manage oneself and one's resources to achieve a goal. So these are kind of those higher level cognitive skills that we use every day to complete um, important tasks such as regulating our behaviors, um, paying attention, organizing ourselves and our tasks or um, planning for the future. So when our executive function skills are impacted, it can have this wide range of effects on um, students' behavior and their learning. <clears throat> so some ways that it could impact students is um, they might be impulsive or have hyperactive behaviors, um, difficulties with planning and sequencing, problem solving and organization, um, understanding cause and effect um, and consequences. So they might behave in a certain undesirable way and not even realize that if I act this way, it might hurt another person. So um, that's kind of a little bit difficult to comprehend for them. They might have challenges with transitions and changes in their days um, and managing their time as well. So these are just some examples of executive functioning skills um, that can be impacted. Uh, the ways that we can support these students is by modeling and teaching and practicing how to plan prior to beginning a task. So some examples of this would be starting with tasks that require planning only a few steps at a time and then gradually increasing the steps required in that plan. Um, prompting the student to think about the task and then develop a plan rather than acting impulsively. Um, using scoring rubrics when giving assignments so they kind of know how to structure their assignment and how they want to complete it. Um, breaking down larger tasks into shorter, more manageable ones, and then using a template for long-term project planning. So those are some examples of ways you can support with the planning. Um, other supports include providing clear and consistent routines, um, providing detailed schedules, and using visual and verbal cues when it's time to change tasks. So all of these kind of help with that um, challenge with transitions and changes. Um, you can provide frequent movement breaks to keep them from getting restless and using real life examples to keep them engaged um, in different tasks. Okay, the fifth domain of brain functioning um, is attention. So paying attention, uh, maintaining attention is the ability to actively process information in our environments while tuning out other details that uh, might be distracting. So attention is often a big concern um, in our classrooms. So these students can be easily distracted. They can have difficulty um, with their selective attention, so determining what is important to pay attention to and what should I ignore, and then sustaining that attention. And because attention is an executive functioning skill, we want to use the strategies that we just reviewed on the previous slide um, in addition to um, these ones, for example. So teaching the student to use self-talk to stay on task, um, providing concrete reinforcements and reminders, uh, limiting visual and auditory distractions, which can be done by providing the student um, with a quiet workspace. And then making activities and assignments as brief as possible. Um, the next domain is adaptive functioning skills, um, which are 
practical everyday skills that we all use and we all need to function and meet the demands of our environments. So for example, um, how to effectively or appropriately communicate with other people, um, different hygiene things like washing our hair, washing our hands, understanding and following safety measures, um, cooking in some instances. So these are all different everyday skills that we use to kind of function. Um, individuals with FASD, they may have a lack of personal boundaries, so they might stand very close to you and speak very closely in your face. Um, they might have difficulty reading social cues, so they might walk up to a group of their peers and kind of barge in on their conversation and not realize that, you know, that's just not something that you would normally do. Um, they can be socially vulnerable. They might have social and emotional immaturity, so how they behave might seem a little bit inappropriate for their age. Um, they can struggle with managing their hygiene, so possibly not realizing that or understanding why it's important that we take showers frequently and why we wash our hands and, and why, why others might not necessarily like it if we didn't do these things. So. Um, and they might lack various types of coping skills, so how to deal with difficult situations. Um, so these students will need different supports in their daily adaptive skills and explicitly being taught how to use these skills. Um, some ways to support are including the students in the process of developing solutions to problems to help them with different um, daily problem solving skills. Um, encouraging positive self-talk so they can feel and know that they're capable of developing different skills. Um, engaging in entire classrooms in sensitive discussions. So for example, hygiene, so that the individual is not being singled out from their classmates. Um, so making it kind of a class-wide topic that everyone can learn from might be a good idea. And then identifying coping skills that would work with the student. Um, so getting their input on what makes them feel happy or what makes them calm, and then including these skills in a plan um, if needed. Okay, the last domain of brain functioning we are going to cover is emotion regulation, which is the ability to manage one's own emotions and behaviors. So this is kind of another big one that we that comes up a lot in our schools. There's many students that struggle with managing their emotions, um, not just those with FASD. Um, so difficulties can include having trouble controlling emotional arousal, so getting super worked up over things, um, reacting either too fast or too slow to situations in an appropriate manner, having challenges interpreting cues. So for example, if they're super worked up around a classmate, that classmate um, might show body language that indicates they're a little bit uncomfortable, um, then this cue might be hard to read for that student. Um, displaying a pattern of dysregulation across a long period of time, so either being underregulated or overly regulated, um, and experience a comorbid or coexistence specified mood or anxiety disorder. So there's many ways to support students struggling with regulating their emotions. Um, some examples include helping them first identify and name their emotions before they can do anything about these emotions. So there's a strategy known as name it to tame it. They got to know what they're feeling before they can do anything about it. And once they name the emotion, uh, lots of modeling and teaching, um, coping and regulation skills. Um, build in routine and plan changes well ahead and talk about what is going to happen and also plan for what to do if things get a little bit too overwhelming. Um, so for example, if there's a pep rally coming up and everyone's gonna be in the gym, you, you wanna give that student notice that we're gonna be having a pep rally, but you also wanna plan with that student, let them know pep rallies can get a little bit noisy. What do we do if things get too overwhelming for you? You, you exit the gym, go and see this person, and that kind of goes in a little plan for that student. Um, matching your expectations and support to that student's level of functioning. So 
you don't want your expert your expectations to overly exceed what that student is functionally capable of doing. Um, try to respond in a calm and empathetic way. Um, difficult behaviors can be very hard to deal with um, day in and day out if you're experiencing them every day. So you as a support person and knowing when you need to take a break um, is just as important for um, helping that student and supporting that student. Um, getting to know the student and recognizing their triggers um, can help to kind of avoid situations um, that could escalate behaviors. Um, there are also various emotion regulation curriculums out there that can be useful to use, such as five-point scale or zones of regulation. Right, so there are other domains um, other than the ones that I just covered. The ones that I covered would be ones that we as school psychologists would likely be involved with and in helping support those areas. Um, students with FASD will also need or possibly require support with um, language, with motor skills, sensory needs, and mental health. So um, you might have involvement from an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, um, speech and language pathologist, and or a student support facilitator. So, so they may also be involved with um, individual student planning. And here is a list of the references that we used um, for the content in this webinar, as well as some useful resources for you to check out if you would like. And thank you so much for attending this webinar on FESC.